All right. So why don't you, uh, David, why don't you start? Okay. Uh, I, I will start asking Katya how things are uh, there, <laughs> how she feel with this problem of not uh, staying in her office, coordinating her students and her lab. <laughs> Good question, right? I mean, just to be very positive. I was reading um, an article on CNN a few minutes ago. So they are doubting schools can reopen in September. Ah. <laughs> so not such a positive note. So they are revising plans. So they are open to open in September, but we don't know. I see. What can we do? It's going to be a long marathon. How are students about this? Are students happy or not happy? I mean, undergraduates are extremely frustrated. And I, and, I mean, I can see, right? They are at home. They are, full, they are in front of the computer for many hours. There are no personal interactions. Many of them are on a different time zone. So there is also a challenge in terms of, you know, the time, right? The classes are at weird times so during night or during the, I mean, and yeah, they're missing interaction with their, with their friends, with their peers. Not only, but I guess that the, the class done on the web <laughs> somehow missing the contact to the professor. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, you know, we, we all try our best and, you know, it was sad and nobody was prepared also for that, right? Suddenly one day we were told, hey, starting tomorrow, you'll teach online. But office hour, I mean, I've been doing office hour on Zoom. <sighs> you can try your best, but it's tricky. I mean, you know, I specifically was debugging codes, MATLAB codes. <laughs> The body in code on Zoom is something, I mean. <laughs> I see, yeah. It's, for us in Italy, it has been very hard because the, the lockdown has started uh, more than two months ago. February, and, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. At, uh, at the end, actually, it started, no, at the beginning of March. So right. it's a long time that we are locked at home. Uh, and... Uh, to tell you the truth, for me, it has been a disaster because working with my PhD student remotely, it's very difficult because if I have to write down something, if I have to explain something, doing this, I mean, uh, without a piece of paper, showing the, the paper uh, on the camera, it's very frustrating. But... No, everything takes double time pretty much, you would accept that, right? What you would do in 10 seconds suddenly becomes minutes. Yeah. And, I see. you know, it's frustrating. I mean, for us, it's also challenging because the kids, right? I mean, your kids, David, they're old enough that I believe they can, you know, <laughs> take care of themselves. My, yes. My kids are in the age that they complain about the university, <laughs> which is locked. <laughs> but of course, how is with your kids? How is... Julia and Diego. They're fine. I mean, I think Ju Diego is suffering a bit. I mean, it is his friends, right? I mean, it's four, four and a half. Julia is, per you know, two. So she doesn't, I'm not sure she realized what's going on. Diego, I believe, is realizing, but what the way he's realizing is missing his friends. Sure. Sure. So. And you have them home. So yeah, for you and Giovanni, it will be a game who, <laughs> who has the permission of work. Yeah, we split day 50-50. So, yeah, we have a nanny for a few today, she's seen three mornings. We try the best, well, the best we can. And this now the weather is becoming nice, right? Nice weather. So at least we can get them out. I see. Don't you have uh, some some desire of, of doing a hike in here in the Alps? <laughs> if one day we will be able to come there. <laughs> I think right now it's not possible. I believe there are no flights. No, we had the permission a few days ago to walk around with a mask, but <laughs> when we are in the middle of the wood, then we can get rid of the mask because fortunately they do not use drones to track <laughs> us and, <laughs> and nobody is watching us. So with my wife, we walk along the street uh, uh, up to a wood, a wood and then we get rid of the mask and we speak <laughs> quietly between us because nobody watches us. 
<laughs> yeah, our firm, uh, yeah, I was thinking that, that yesterday I went out. I mean, we are, you've been at my place, right? So we are in Ima Square, so quite central. It's a different universe. Everybody with a mask, you cannot see the faces. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody try to get rid of the mask as soon as they don't see nobody around, all the masks come down. Yeah, for, for all people, it's a bit tough because it's difficult to breathe. I mean, yeah. for me, if I, if I walk fast, then sometimes I have problems in breathing. I have to stop because <laughs> yeah. breathing in carbon dioxide, it's not very It's nice. a respiratory exercise. Yeah. It's training. Because you and Giovanni are two athletes. So how can when you survive? We, oh. we go out running with a stroller. In these days, I go out running at noon, a one. So the kids nap on the stroller and we run. I see. Uh, with the mask. But then what you try is to get rid of the mask. You, you run out. with the mask? You when you have people, you put down the mask and then you take it out. It's more <laughs> of an exercise of up and down with the mask. <laughs> and not only us, everyone. I'm wondering how it will be possible to go back inside an airplane. Maybe someone is planning to, to invent some helmet with a, a, a supply of oxygen. And so people can stay close to each other, but without interacting in any way. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, right now I believe they've, they are flying 50% uh, capacity, right? They keep one spot empty, yeah. but I mean, it, from an economic point of view, is not what you want to do. No. And in Italy, as far as I understand, the flights are all uh, cancelled. Yeah. It's very it's difficult to fly. Yeah, and Italia has been losing quite a bit of money on this business because, sure. yeah, because basically they need to bring back a lot of Italian citizens from the US to Italy. Yeah, I have one of my colleagues who is trapped in the US because <laughs> he was there when the lockdown took place uh, and now he is unable to come back to Italy. <laughs> yeah, I believe if you're here and you are not a city, yeah, so you, you kind of get trapped, right? There are several people that are trapped. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah. How so? You are out of your lab, uh, speaking to the with the students through the so, internet? Yeah. I mean, I think same stuff everywhere, right? Same as in Italy. The labs yeah. are all closed. Hopefully, maybe in Isodanian. So hopefully they will reopen in June. We hope in June. But in very limited capacity, very yeah. limited capacity, reduced capacity. I heard that in Germany they are open. Good for them. <laughs> Good for them. Yeah. Yeah. For, I'm I mean, glad that today I was able to come in my office because <laughs> I had the, the excuse that I need a high speed connection to manage uh, this uh, webinar. And so I asked the permission and I got. And so Actually, there is nobody around, so I will be not infected <laughs> by anybody. I, I don't think uh, to be infected since I am home since two months continuously. I didn't exit even to, to get food. So I don't think to be one infected, but... It's a tricky game, right? And it's yeah. a marathon, it's a long run. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll be over at a certain point. Yeah, all, all our congresses have been cancelled. I believe this week we were supposed to be here in Cambridge, right? There was supposed yeah. to be Jim Rice celebration. Yes, there was. I believe Jim it's Rice supposed to be this week or next week. I don't remember. Yeah, it was uh, May 18. So next week, Monday next week. Yeah, next week. Uh, so I was supposed to, to come and I bought the airplane ticket, but it was cancelled. And actually, Lufthansa uh, wrote that she will, they will give the money back because actually we didn't use this. We could not use this flight. I mean, I think the flight didn't exist. I mean, it was canceled. No, it doesn't exist anymore, yeah. So when are, when are the plans to reopen in Italy? So when are you gonna teach again in, on campus? They say that uh, we will start probably uh, mid-September with a so-called um, mixed, mixed way. I mean, it is called, they call it, uh, um, well, I don't remember the name, 
but it means that we can go in the class with a very, uh, with a reduced number of students and there are uh, video recording. So part of the students are supposed to stay home and watch the monitor and a small group of student, uh, students have the right to stay in the class uh, and see the, the class in the, in, the, in the old way, in the old fashion. But the, the thing is not clear to me because I do not understand how to decide who yeah. can enter in the room and who should stay outside. This is, this is something which I do not understand. But, but so probably they, they're going to rotate. They're going to rotate the students, right? I mean, I have no idea. But, but if they do so, it means that uh, I have to repeat the same class several times. Uh, which could be a, a bit annoying because, you know, to say the same things uh, four times, five times. My class is more or less 100 students. So if only 25 have the permission to enter, I mean, four, uh, times. four times, I mean, <laughs> I will become a mad, mad professor. <laughs> yeah, for us, it's going to be, it's very likely it's going to be online, remote next semester. So, you know, we don't have still the final word, but it's, they are saying probably 95% has put in these terms. So it's very, very likely that we are going to be remote. Yeah, uh, the, here uh, the administration is preparing uh, special rooms equipped with uh, recording systems where a professor can, can teach and be recorded with a uh, good quality, let's say, and the students can watch home but to me it's a bit sad because i'm accustomed to communicate very much <laughs> at a high level to, with students so if i know to be recorded then i will not be natural yeah, it's... Italia, yeah. i have yes. a question for you tell me about a david was he a good reasonable advisor <laughs> The best advisor, right? <laughs> we had arguments from time to time, but not many, I think. Mm. I still remember the first time. So I never took a class with David. Ah. Because uh, basically the class, the, be the basic solid mechanics class, introductory solid mechanics, Scienza de Ricostruzione is the name in Italian, uh, was given by, uh, by David and Giorgio Novati. They were alternating. No, they were depending on your uh, alphabetical, uh, the, um, your uh, um, family name. You were assigned either to one or the other. They were in parallel. So it was assigned to the other. So unlikely, never took a class with him. But then at a certain point, I needed that. Uh, I was looking for a thesis advisor. And I ran into his office. And it was what I su was surprised. It was so enthusiastic. Everyone else was giving me trouble. So oh, this problem I don't like, this is too complicated, whatever, right? And I ran into David and he was so enthusiastic. He told me, yes, we can do it. The constraint, I wanted to write it in English because I needed to use it also. So I could basically defend it both in Italy and in Sweden. And I remember everybody else was giving me trouble. So, you know, giving, telling me, oh, no, this is difficult, this is challenging. And David was like, yes, of course we can do it. Let's do it immediately. <laughs> and so that's where we started working together. <laughs> Uh -huh. And then at a certain point, I believe you, David, they asked me, uh, well, you know, there was this PhD, in Italy, PhD program at the time were not very popular. And very, very few students, right? Two students per year were admitted in the entire department. So it was not a thing. But I remember David was the one, who, you know, threw the idea out there, telling me, you know, there is these opportunities. What do you think? And then we took it from there. So yeah. you spend some years in uh, Wisconsin. One year. One year. Why? Did that you know, six, six months. We were there together. David was also there. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. happened because uh, Walt Drugan got a fellowship again from the Italian government. There was a program to bring back Italian people. And I have no idea why Walt Drugan got into this program. I mean, he's not he has not Italian descendant as far as I know, but somehow he got into the program. So he was spending for three years, six months in Italy and six months in Wisconsin. And somehow one of the constraints connected to this fellowship was that he was supposed to interact with Italian students. And so yeah, yeah I started working with both of them. It was a good occasion. I had a brilliant student. And, and so I said, Walt, 
do you would like to share this student? And of course, he was very happy of sharing Katia. And so he spent six months here for, for actually it was for four years. And so it covered all the PhD of Katia. And then on one occasion, we all moved in Wisconsin because we wanted to continue to work. Uh, and so I had the, uh, the freedom of moving for, for a short sabbatical of six months. And uh, we went all together uh, with Katia to Wisconsin, to that Madison. Nice. That was for, nice. It was nice, yes. It was nice for me too. My kids were small. I mean, for me, it's a beautiful memory. Good PhD students, <laughs> not, not troublemakers. <laughs> not troublemakers. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was an, I really love my PhD. And I still, I mean, every time I talk with my student now, I remember how I learned to write paper. I was sitting next to David. You remember, David? I still remember the desk where you're sitting now. Yeah. And basically, you know, he was typing. I was next. Providing, learning. More than providing suggestions, just learning how to do the job. I think it's a remarkable, efficient way to learn. Yeah, uh, Katya, when did you graduate from a PhD? Which year? 206. 206? No, yeah, 206, I believe. I believe it's 206. And then you joined our And then um, boys Mary Boys. In two months. Yeah, so Italy, the PhD program is a fixed amount of time, right? So it's three years. So when you start, you already know when you're going to finish, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So I believe I finished, I'm pretty sure in February, because typically the defense is January, February 2016, and immediate 2006, and in March, I joined um, Mary Boys, so, yeah, and then I was there until 2000, one year and a half, pretty much, until May 2007, uh -huh. 2008, May 2008. Then when you went back to Europe. And then I was in the Netherlands until from August 2008 until one year and a half, roughly, right? And then I came back on January 2010. That part we knew. We had an <laughs> international competition for the attention of Katia. We won. I can tell you a story about Katia as a PhD student. She was knocking my door in the morning uh, to ask for some advice. And so I spent it with her a few hours to explain her what to do and so on. And then, uh, of course, um, we separated. And in the afternoon, she was knocking the door of Walt Ruger, who was here, to ask more. And during the night, she was developing everything. So the day after, she was again knocking the door because she has that. She was able to do everything we said. Her. And every day we had the uh, Katia taxis knocking the door and asking more and more and more. Uh, and, uh, she was very efficient. <laughs> I still remember the huge laptop. I remember at a certain point we bo I bought what was my first laptop, and we were all like, very excited. David, you included, and it was huge. This laptop I was using in the evening to try to get stuff done. Yeah. It was good. It was a small group. The computer of Katya was always hot. And one of he, uh, her um, colleagues, I mean, one of the other PhD students, bought to her a sort of little ventilator to cool the, her computer down because it was always hot with calculations. <laughs> Ah, good times. Yeah. All right. On one, on one occasion, uh, Walt Drugan told, told me that he wanted to run with Katia. And I said, don't do that because Katia is a real athlete. He's not an old man. Uh, he went to run with Katia. And the day after, he was all, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, come on. Yeah, I think he was not used to the steep uh, Alps. <laughs> All right, David, uh, it's uh, 10 o'clock now. You can Actually, start. We have to, to start. So, dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is my pleasure to manage this uh, webinar, uh, EML webinar. My name is David Bigoni, and I am a professor at the University of Trento. 
The guest of the webinar of today is a star of Harvard, as Professor Bertoldi. Uh, Katia uh, took uh, her graduation in Italy. She was born in Italy and she graduated at the University of Trento, my university. At the same time, she got also a master in structural engineering at the um, university, uh, at the Chalmer University in Sweden. And after her graduation, she decided to continue with, with her PhD. And she was advised by Professor Walt Drugan and myself, and she got the PhD at the University of Trent. After her PhD, she uh, moved to MIT for a couple of years. And after that period, she was able to obtain uh, an assistant professor position at Harvard. It was more or less 10 years ago. And since that time, she um, did a lot of intense research on uh, structural mechanics, structural engineering, and she became professor, and she's now uh, professor of applied mechanics at Harvard University. She got several awards, and in particular, uh, she, I would like to mention the ASME Thomas Hughes Award for Young Investigators. She's an expert in structural mechanics, and today she will speak of application of structural mechanics, which are challenging. We are accustomed to think to structural mechanics as an old discipline needed to design bridges and to design uh, building frames and so on. But this is not all. I mean, with structural engineering, Katia will explain us that we can do much more and think to new materials, think to new structure to be used in several applications. So now, I guess it's the time for Katia. I will uh, leave her the monitor, let's say like this. And the title of her talk, as you may see, is Multistable Structures from Energy Trapping to Morphing. So please, Katia, thank you. Thanks. So can you hear me clearly? Yeah, yeah. Are you okay. Perfect. So well, thanks, David, for introduction. It's always an honor to be introduced by your advisor. Thanks, Gigan, Tang, and Jimmy to put this EML webinar series together. I think it's one of the highlights of this uh, challenging time, right? And I think it's a very nice way to bring all of us, the mechanics community, together. So today, as David pointed out, I want to discuss some of our recent work on multi-stable structure. And really what we are doing, we are trying to use uh, basically structural engineering and the principle of structural engineering to design structure with uh, enhanced functionality. And to do this, we use a combination, as you see, of theory, numerics, and experiments. So the focus here is on multiple structure, multi-stable structure, sorry. So we'll focus on structure made of elastomeric materials. And this structure, I mean, this movie here now, unfortunately, is not properly, it's run only once, I cannot get running more, but this structure can deform a lot. But then typically an elastic structure, as soon as you remove the load, it goes back to the initial configuration. So here is a typical, I would like you to focus on the energy landscape. You see we have a single minimum, right? It's convex. Now, what has been known also for a long time is, that what we can do if we properly design the structure, even an elastic structure, by, might be by stable. And so my have two stable configuration. As you can see in this movie, when you have a membrane and you see one of my students poking this membrane, you see that basically snap to the other configuration, then it remains there. Even when the finger is removed, the structure remains there. This is a bistable structure. And um, what we see is that the energy landscape of this structure is quite peculiar and is characterized by two energy minima, two, and this corresponds to the two stable configurations. Now, the fact that we can design bistable structure has been known for a very, very long time. And, uh, but what recently researchers, engineers, and physicists have been trying to do is try to exploit this property to basically as a platform to design smart structures. And here you can see three examples. So on the left here, you see early work by Doug Holmes at BU when he was still a graduate student with Al Crosby. And so they exploit the by stability of basically thin shells to achieve to basically to, 
to achieve tunable, to design tunable lenses. In the middle here is war, recent war by Lorenzo Valdevit, and in this case, by stability has been exploited to basically achieve shape changes, to program shape changes. And finally, on the right here is work by Chiara Daraio, where by stability has been used to achieve propulsion, even to get this small robot to move in water. And so in my group, we have been thinking along this line, and we have been trying to identify ways to, to basically exploit by stability, multi-stability for functionality. And here are the example I want to discuss in the project I want to discuss with you today. So I want to start discussing how we can use by stability to trap elastic energy. So, so how we can use them by stability to basically realize deployable structure, to control elastic signal, and also to design, to enhance the functionality of soft robots and for example, enable them to jump easily. And finally, we also see how basically by stability ena enable us to propagate instabilities in Kirigami shells. All right, so let's start focusing on the first project. So this was a project, it's a, it was, we carried this out in 2015, so it's a reasonably old project. It was in collaboration with uh, Jennifer Lewis. And, um, and here you can see Sikon Shan was a student at my time, and then Sankun and Jordan, who uh, were now a faculty at John Hopkins and at UPenn. Okay, so the idea behind this project is very, very simple. So we want, we, here is, uh, we want to focus on multi-stable architecture, and what we want is to trap energy. So how can we trap energy? So first of all, we want to focus on a, on an elastic by stable structure in which the minima are at two different levels. So there is a lower energy minima and an higher energy minima. And now what can we do? So if we imagine that our structure initially sits in the lower energy minima, and somehow we are able to push it to the other minima, then what we can see is that this will enable us to lock most of the energy inserted during loading. So this amount of energy, that delta E that you can see here. And so now the question is, okay, how can we realize that a structure? How can we realize this? So which structural element have such energy profile? Well, many, to our, so we are lucky here. And for example, one very simple one that has such a profile is a tilted beam. And if we design the, the um, if we choose the tilting angle and the slenderness properly, we can realize a beam that's mapped between two stable configuration, and we can see that the two stable configuration has two different energy levels. So first of all, we need to identify the geometric combination of uh, the geometric um, parameter combination leading to bistability. And so in this case, what we did, we use finite element. We consider a single beam, and then we vary both the slenderness and the tilting angle, so this theta here, and we characterize pretty much the, the energy barrier. So the energy absorb and the energy barrier to snap back. And here you see I plot the energy absorb and the energy barrier to snap back. And when you see a colorful a pixel, a color pixel, it means this, config, this specific configuration is bistable. If you see a white pixel or a gray pixel, it means the structure is not bistable. So what we see, we have a range of geometric parameters for which the structure is bistable. That's good. So now what we can do, for example, we can pick one of these configurations. And now we can try to realize. So we can basically assemble this element, as you can see, in one the array to form a structure. This is a pretty much a 1D structure, only, only as this behavior when excited by compressed vertically. So now you see beside this, we arrange this element in these long lines and separated by rigid, um, by rigid and very stiff layers to basically impose the boundary condition. We see that what we have is a bistable structure. This is very good. So, and now, now the question is, is this energy, is this structure capable of absorbing energy? So here you can see a proof of concept basically experiment. So you see a multi-stable structure. Here you see control structure, the same, con the same structure, but in which all basically beam have been snapped in a, in a prior to the experiment. And so what we can see in one case, when the structure touched the ground, the egg basically, you know, is preserved 
Instead, for the control case, we can see that when basically the structure touch ground, it bounces, and as a result, then the egg breaks. So here, this gives sort of an idea of how this multi-stability multi can be used to, is able to trap, can be used to trap energy, this simple structure. And here are some quantitative data we collect. And uh, so here you can see the acceleration as a function of time. We put an accelerometer on top of our sample when dropping them. And what we can see the red line correspond to our multi-stable sample. And instead the gray line correspond to the control. So what we can see is that multi-stable really show enable us to significantly reduce the peak acceleration at the time of impact. And so basically in this case, and to protect so the, ob the object on top of our structure. So this is, um, this is basically what I want to tell you about this project. One interesting point I want to make is when we got this paper published at the same time, a paper on EML, this is a EML webinar. So a paper on EML was published on a very, very similar topic. So pretty much you know, presenting the identical ideas, I would say. We didn't know, we were working, but basically we had two groups, my group and the group of Pablo Zavattieri at Purdue, working at the same time on these ideas. Unfortunately, we were not aware of that. And then when our paper got published at the same time on EML, we also got a paper proposing I, I would say identical ideas with slightly different system, but the same concept. And uh, this, and um, yeah, so after that, we have several discussion. And also, if you're interested in this topic, I, I suggest you to follow the work of Pablo, because then he, what he has also been doing, is he has been extending this work to also to the structures. So what I present is also basically a 1D realization of this mechanism. All right. So in this first example, what we are seeing is how we can use best stability to uh, trap energy. More, um, more recently, we have also been trying to use by stability to deploy structure. And this is work done by, with my postdoc Ahmad and my current uh, and my PhD student, Bole. So again, we focus on bistable structure with an identical energy landscape as the one I showed you before. So we have two energy minima and these two energy minima at a different level. But now what we think is the following. So we, what we want is to have the structure initially in the higher energy level minima before we want we start the structure from here. In this case, we want at the beginning to be here. And then what we want to do is we want to push the structure to the lower energy minima. And in this case, what happened, we are going to release energy. And so then the question is, okay, how can we take advantage of this energy release? Well, one, um, one thing we can realize using this energy release is to basically realize a domino effect. So to do this, what we need, we need an array of such a bistable elements, and then the idea is if basically we can, we, if you're able to push one element from the higher energy level to the lower, this on the, this basically, if this communicate with the next element, this will push the next element. And so the next, so if we start sort of a chain reaction. And so we can basically have one after the other, all elements going from one configuration to the other. So, now, this sort of phenomena goes under the name of transition waves. So these are large amplitude waves, nonlinear waves that enable switching from one between basically multiple stable configuration, one stable configuration to the other. And this wave have been shown to play an important role in a variety of uh, mechanical phenomena. Think about um, ferroelectric phase transition, chain memory effect, transformational plasticity. And more recently, they have also been engineered in a structure, in mechanical mass material. To, and here you can see two examples. So the example here you can see on the right comes from uh, Chiara Zdraya group, a Caltech. And in this case, they, they have been using, they were able to, they've been shown that they can use transition way to achieve unidirectional propagation. Since the energy profile is not symmetric, you can go one way, but you cannot, but you cannot come back. And uh, here on the bottom is early work from my group, together also with Chiara, Dennis, and uh, Jennifer. And in this case, what we show is that we can take advantage of this energy release to propagate a signal for very long distances, even in a uh, structure made of a highly dissipative material. Okay, so inspired by this study, motivated by this study, more recently we started, can we also use this transition way 
to deploy a structure. So imagine we start with a flat structure, then we kick it. And somehow this can take a three dimensional shape, right? So this is our goal. So here you can see us, our first experiment, but you also see that really we are not really realizing what we want, right? We see that there is a transition wave, we start, but then it stops quite early. Let's try to understand, but let me give you more detail about the system and let's see if we can improve the result I show you here. So here is our very, very simple system. It's a 1D linkage. So comprising basically a 1D one, a one array of rigid bars. So you can see these bars. And um, they are connected at the end by hinges. And these hinges are designed so that they, they allow rotation only between zero and a maximum angle capital theta. So you see basically because contact at the bottom and at the top prevent the, this, uh, these bars to rotate further. Okay. And then to make them multi-stable, what we do, we connect neighboring bars with a linear spring. And the spring goes from the center of one bar to the center of the next bar. And now what we can play, we can play with the distance at which we, we basically locate this bar respect to the, li the line basically connecting the hinges. So this is distance D. So we can vary this distance D. So if you choose D equal to zero, so basically the springs are, are on the line of the hinges, of the line connecting the hinges, what we find, we find um, this, the hinges, basically the structure is unstable in the initial flat configuration. So the structure wants to curve. So it's not a multi-stable structure, it's a monostable structure. They all hinges want to bend. On the other hand, if we shift delta and we bring it up a little bit, in this case, d over l, where l is the length of the bar and this is distance is equal to 0 0.0, we see that now the joints are stable both at zero, so in the flat configuration and in the, um, and that in the deploy configuration, the curve configuration. So at, uh, for the basically when the angle equal to the maximum angle, allowed angle. Okay, so now we have been able to realize that by stable structure. So now what we can do, we can try to, you know, we have here our structure, we can try to provide a perturbation. So we kick it, we provide a kick, and then we see how this, how the structure deform. We see, we look at the deformation over time. So here, what I'm reporting is the, um, the angle of the joints as a function of time. And what we see is we provide the perturbation. We, one after the few inches start to bear one, basically bend, another one bend, another one bend, but then we see at a certain point after four inches, after four basically joints, we see that the structure, the wave stop. And then basically it remains here, right? It doesn't, not all the hinges basically go from the flat configuration to the curved configuration. Okay, so what, what can we do? One idea, maybe we can increase them. Clearly we, what we can do, we can increase the energy with the, um, the magnitude of the applied perturbation. So we can increase the energy that we supply to the system. So here is um, an, another experiment. I'm reporting that for another experiment where we increase the magnitude of the plate perturbation. We see that things get better, but still we think that they were basically this way cannot reach the end of the structure. And one important point is the larger the magnitude of the applied deformation, the more, the more damage we introduce also into the structure. So pretty much, you know, when we introduce this large amplitude pulse, the structure is only able to withstand one or two tests and then breaks. So this is an issue. So how can we overcome this issue? So, well, first of all, what we want to do before we overcome the issue, we want to make sure that what we see in the experiments is not due to artifact. It's not due to friction with, 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 between the structure and the surface. It's not due to the fact that the structure is not, is not you know, imperfection introduced during fabrication. So what we do first, we establish a numerical model. So it's basically a discrete model where the bar are assumed to be legit. And then we have a number of springs introduced in order to capture the behavior on the system. So here you can see the, we start writing down the Lagrangian of the system where we have the kinetic energy. So here you can see the kinetic energy of for each bar. The, and then we also, we clearly, we, have, we also need to account for the contribution of the springs. Those are linear springs. And then finally, we also need to introduce the constraints. So the fact that at the joints, the beams basically are linked together. And in this case, what we do we introduce three springs and we make them very stiff. 
And so this basically imposes the fact that the beams, the bars at the joints needs to basically stick together, right? They are tied together and they can only rotate. And then what we do when we have the Lagrangian, we derive this discrete equation of motion. We also include a friction and then we integrate numerically using Luga q -tab. And here we can see, and here what I'm showing you is the experimental result I showed you before. But now what you see on top of that, we have this red line and these are the prediction of the, our numerical simulation. So we can see very good agreement between numerics and experiment. So it means that what we observe is not in the experiment is not because of artifact, but it's really intrinsic an intrinsic sort of property of the structure. So now the question is, okay, how can we realize, how can we modify the design to realize structure in which transition way initiated by low energy passes can propagate through the entire structure? How can we improve our system? And so here is a very simple idea we explore and it turned out to be successful. So in the example I showed you before, springs were connecting one unit to the next one. So, and um, instead now what we do, we change the connectivity of the spring. Now spring does not connect anymore unit I and I plus one, but I and I plus two, I minus one and I plus one. So instead of nearest neighbor, now we go, we basically the spring connect next nearest neighbor. And remarkably, this has a very important effect on the energy landscape of the system. So now when we introduce next nearest neighbor and we focus on the inch on the joint I, what we see is that the joint before is uh, flat. Then joint I is stable both in the flat and in the, um, in the folded, let's say in the curve configuration, both a theta equals zero, a theta equals theta capital theta. However, as soon as the joint I minus one bend, then we see the basic, as soon as the joint I minus one snap, what well, we see that the joint I becomes monostable. And, uh, and so this forces it basically to snap. So what happens we introduce next nearest neighbor is snapping of one joint make the next joint monostable and pretty much force it to snap because the flat configuration is not anymore stable. And so now we can go, we can try to realize, you know, we can basically implement this into our system. The only thing we did, we changed the connectivity between the, the springs. Now what we can see, we just provide a kick. Now our structure go, all the inches basic up and the structure go from the flat initial configuration to a curved one. And uh, here again, as data started from the movie I show you. So what we can, what we can see in this start in case, we can see that the waves goes all the way. And we can see also, you know, we can also change our numerical, uh, adapt our numerical simulation to capture this, uh, the, the behavior of this structure. The only thing we have to change is the connectivity of the springs. And again, we can see a very good agreement between the simulations and the experiments. All right, so now the question is, what can we use this for? And an idea we just started exploring is to use this phenomenon to realize deployable structures. So structure, the idea we have, we have the structure, initially they're flat, and then you just provide a little kick and a little perturbation, and this structure can transform into complex 3D structure. Ideally, you would like to transform into an emergency, emergency shelter, into protective barrier, into protective walls, whatever you need. So now what do we need to go from the simple structure, simple one, the linkages I show you to complex, to deployable structure of arbitrary shape. So first of all, we need the linkage to be able to transform into arbitrary profiles. And second, we need to somehow to be able to assemble those linkages into a network to give us a 3D shape. And so okay, let's tackle these two these two required one by one. So first of all, we need to basically be what we want to be able to do is realize profiles of arbit arbitrary profiles. And uh, by changing the joint, so by changing the maximum angle that the, at which basically the, to which the, the bars can snap, we can change the curvature along the profile. However, we cannot switch from positive to negative curvature. So if you want to switch from positive to negative curve, curvature, what we, we identify as a potential strategy is what we can do, we can couple two different, we can couple basically two, two linkages. And if we choose, and if we couple them correctly, in this case, we couple them at this basically 
inches highlighted in red, what we can do, we can, we, we can also make sure that the transition wave propagate from one linkage to the other. So when coupling them, what we need to ensure is that the wave can propagate from one to the other. And in this case, what you see, we then we are able basically also to switch curvature, to switch sign of curvature, to go from positive to negative curvature. So this idea, this is basically a simple, a simple demonstration. So we also realize that and now we see that basically if if you choose the, if you couple them correctly, now we can also get the weights transmit from one profile to the other. And in this case, to also basically in this case, we are able to switch curvature. And here you can see two pictures taken from the same, two snapshots from the same movie. Okay. So then the last point we want, we would like to be able to do is also to form network, right? Because the idea is, okay, can we form arbitrary surface? So somehow we need to be able to form networks to span arbitrary open surfaces. And um, so we want to bring them together. And again, what the important point here, what we need to make sure, we need to ensure is that the signal can propagate from one element to the other. And so, to realize that, what we introduce, we need to introduce rigid elements to enable the coupling, but at the same time, you see, we also introduce additional springs. And those springs that you can see here, I'm highlighting with my pointer, are there in order to make sure that this, this signal gets transmitted from one element to the other. And then here you can see a simple demonstration, again, at the desktop scale, so this is, you know, 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter, roughly the structure you're seeing. And now you see that basically we kick it only on one leg, but then all legs basically bend. And so we form a sort of a dome. And here four pictures taken from the same, basically from the same movie I show you. So here is pretty much where we are with this. And uh, this is quite a recent project. And now we really hope to be able to apply this concept also a large scale. And so hopefully we, we, this will also be enabled to realize, you know, deployable structure that can, we can easily put in place. And since they are be sta by stable, they can also stay in place after basically we apply a simple perturbation. Recently, we have also been uh, exploited the idea of transition wave into the system to to facilitate or to enhance the ability to guide waves. So basically to guide elastic pulses along specific paths. So this project is a project in collaboration with Daniel Kochman at ETH and his postdoc Romic, and was really driven by my former postdoc Ahmad Rafsajani and um, current postdoc Jochen Muller and current student Li Shui. So this project started with Ahmad Rafsajani joined my group in 2000. Uh, 17. And before that, he was working with Damiano Pazzini at uh, McGill. And when working with Damiano Pazzini, he identified a family of Kirigami structure that are bistable. And here you can see an example of those. And again, nice point here. These results were presented in a paper published in Extreme Mechanics Letter, EML, in 2016. So I highly recommend you to go and look at this paper. It's a very nice piece of work. And so what you realize, these structure are made of rubber and they realize by carefully choosing the, the cut, the shape and the geometry of the cuts, they were able to realize structure with two stable configuration. So when I might join my group, then we started thinking about the, can we also, can we use this by stable system also? Can we explore the dynamic of this behavior? And here you can see one of the first experiment we run. So what you see here is a large, basically what we fabricated, we fabricated a large structure. You see a large array with exactly the same geometric element I showed you in the slide before that were previously identified by Ahmad. And then what we wanted to do, we wanted to basically explore the dynamic behavior. And so what we were simply doing, we were simply providing a kick. We started by providing a kick basically at one end and see how the signal and basically observe the dynamic behavior of our system. And as you, I hope you catch in the movie that was running, Basically, what we, were, what we were seeing is that we basically were propagating in this system, switching, and basically so that the structure was going from this initially expanded configuration to the, um, to the compact and uh, configuration. So the, the, the slide I showed before is one of the very first experiments. Then we wanted to be a bit more, when we saw that there were these waves were propagating, we wanted to be more quantitative. So 
we run a series of experiments. We, in the experiment before, we had fingers coming in. Now what you see, we have an indentator, an indenter here. So we are controlling the, uh, the input we provide. We also have an acrylic plate that you now see on top of the sample to prevent autoplane deformation. So in the movie I showed you before, if you notice that some of the, the structure was deforming out of plane, out of plane. This was prevented in this case because of an acrylic plate. And now on top of that, we added also this marker. You see this black dot. And now what we are doing, we can track the area in, of the triangle defined by these markers. And uh, when you see, and now when you see purple, it means this, the, this, the unit is open. And when you see yellow, it means basically the unit is closed. So this gives us an idea of the state of the structure. And what we see when, when basically we, we start indenting, at the beginning we close the wave the, we close the unit clo uh, next to the indenter, but at a certain point, these waves take over and the entire structure uh, close very quickly. And uh, an interesting aspect of this system, this is a fully 2D system. And so what we can do now, we can also, for example, put defect. And this is something you cannot really do in 1D because in 1D, if you put a defect, basically you stop the way because you simply have a chain. A chain. But now in 2D, what we can use, we can use defects, for example, to guide as an opportunity. Defects give us an opportunity to guide the propagation of elastic pulses. So here you can see two, two basically, to example, so what we have, when you see this Y, this is nothing as a defect. What do we mean with a defect? It means we basically put something very stiff into few selected holes to prevent their closure. So these four units are forced to stay open. And now what we see is that basically changing the location of this defect, in this case is at the right, of the indenter, in this case is at the left, we can have the way propagating clockwise or counterclockwise. So all this is good. We were quite excited. But, but then what we wanted to do at the same time to do, we wanted to better characterize these waves. So we wanted to see the, we wanted to characterize the speed of propagation of these waves. So what we started doing, we started doing experiment on a very long chain. So this is the same structure. It's just a different arrangement, tessellation of units, where we basically have a long, long, a long strip. And, um, and then we started testing it. So you see in this case, and what we see, we kick it, some, some of the unit close, but really we don't go very far. And we try, you know, then you can say, okay, it's because of friction. So then what we did, we try uh, minimizing friction, but really uh, nothing, we really couldn't get to go much longer than that. And, what we realize and what it seems to be is that the energy release in, by this system is not basically enough in order to make it to propagate for very long distance. And now you might ask why in a 1D system doesn't go and why in a 2D system goes? Well, this is because if you just look at a one unicell, if you just want um, a single unicell, a single unicell is not bistable. So here the bistability comes because of the tessellation. So depending on the way you arrange your structure, the, the energy level, so the energy that is released by your system vary. So, and in this case where we have this uh, slim and long structure, the energy release basically is not enough to compensate for the friction, for the friction and therefore to get the waves going. So then we thought, okay, can we change the design? Can we at least identify a structure in which we can basically, you know, also for different configuration, we can able to propagate these waves. So then we get inspired again by Damiano Pazzini. This is a paper he published in 2018 when he proposed this design. So what we did, and an interesting point of this design is this, we can fabricate of a stiffer material. The structure I showed you before, we, we are fabricated using natural rubber. This structure was, uh, is fabricated using acrylic. That is specific, sorry, therein. And, uh, and so it's much lighter, so frictional forces don't play such a big role. But again, what you can see also in this case, we see that the waves doesn't go, so the structure snap, but in this case, what, the, what we see is that the, when the units snap are not able to transmit the signal to the, transmit the signal to the next units. And so then where we got the idea, the idea was, okay, how can we transmit the, in a, in the interaction between cell? How can we basically get 
cell to communicate better with the neighboring cell. And to facilitate this, what we simply did, we extended these pins. So basically what we added, there are these gray, these, sorry, green regions. And so now what happened, what the, the effect of this is that when a unit closes, it directly push on the next unit. And then in this case, basically we see that the way it can go. Now at the same time, we want also to be able to model the system because then, you know, it's good to have predictive tool, first of all, to make sure that what we see in experiment reflect the behavior of the system and not artifact introduced during the test. And in the same way, if you, at the same time, if you have a mo modeling tools, we can also then design structure with target behaviors. So the modeling here was, uh, is an, was mostly, it was led by Dennis Kochman at ATH, at ATH and his uh, postdoc uh, Romic. And it's based on a very, it's basically borrowed, it's based on ideas coming from solid solid phase transformation. And what we do, we basically model each unit as a bistable unit, a bistable unit with two energy minima. And then we neglect inertia effect. And uh, we also include some, uh, some viscous dissipation to account for all the dissipation introduced into our system. And so here in a very briefly is the basic of the basic ingredient of this model. So we have a free energy density and this, and this, uh, we have two contribution coming in, a volumetric contribution that captures the cell by stability. In this case, we use a force or the polynomial to capture it. And these coefficients are, then we can feed them to the energy profile we can extract from finite element for a given structure. And then we have a deviatoric contribution that captures the long range effects and then we can basically write down the stress. When we have the energy, we can derive the Cauchy stress tensor. And then we can add, we can add a viscous term to capture uh, all the form of dissipation. And then we can just you know, write down a balance of linear momentum and we can numerically solve it. And so now here are the comparison between experiment and simulation. And what we can see, we can see a, very, a good agreement. We can see this, the numerics capture what's going on, not only quant qualitatively, but also quantitatively. So in experiment, we measure a wave propagating at 5.2 meters second, uh, per second. In our experiment, in, uh, sorry, in our experiment 5.2, in our numerics, we, we basically, the waves are propagating at 5.5 meters per second. So very, very close. And now, and now we can also, use the same design, we can use the same structure to realize more of 2D tessellation. And now we can see, for example, we can explore what are the effect of boundary conditions. So you see here we load it at different positions. And what we see is that by changing the, the location of the indenter, we can have the way propagate straight, propagate clockwise, propagate uh, uh, counterclockwise. And then again, we can also explore, we can exploit defects. So we can introduce defects in the system. Again, this black Y you see, those are units that are prevented to close because basically we fill the, the gaps, the voids with a very stiff particle. And again, what we can see is that defect can be used to, guide, to basically guide the propagation of these waves. And we can see that depending on the position of the defect, depending on the size of the structure, defect can block wave, can get the wave propagating in specific direction, or can get the waves propagating in specific direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. And uh, experimentally, there is, I mean, given, there are limited, right now we are limited in the size of the tessellation. We can explore clearly, I mean, if we would like to go with larger tessellation, we should be able to, we should downscale the size of the unicell, but focusing on this uh, centimeter scale, we are limited in the number, maximum number of units we can place into a system. But numerically, you know, now we, what we can do, we can use our numerical analysis to explore more com complex scenarios. And so here, what we can see, for example, we have two defects and we can see we can get the wave go to clockwise. Now we same two defect, but we change the location. We can get the waves the wave to go counterclockwise. Here we have an array of defects up and down. And what we can see, we can get a sort of serpentine motion. And you know, then we can get crazy and also get a boy from a sad to happy. And so here is pretty much where we are with this project. So I think it's quite exciting. Now we have seen that I think what we are see, we have be able to show, and what other other group have shown is this multi 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 stable system. Non-linear way provide opportunity to control signal and also, you know, to basically very quickly change shape. 
and I, I'm pretty sure there is much to explore here. So far, we have been looking at energy, have been looking at transmission of signal. What we have been also focusing recently is on uh, basically exploiting mobility and snapping to improve the design of robots. And so, and here is work mostly done by my, um, my, my current postdoc, Benjamin Goris, Benjamin and my student, David. So what we are focusing, what our focus is inflatable soft machines. So inflatable soft robots. So these are very simple machine built out of elastomeric mass, compliant material, typically elastomer, that, have, uh, that in recent years have become very popular because they're, they're compliance, because they're easy fabrication, and because with very simple input, a pressure input, they are able to achieve reasonably complex output. And you know, they're flexible, they're compliant, and so they are also suitable for interacting with uh, people and delicate objects. So here you can see, for example, rehabilitation. And here you can see that this soft robot is picking up eggs. Now, if we, a limitation of this inflatable soft machine is that they are slow. And while they are slow, well, typically, if you, their energy landscape is typically smooth and monotonic. So it's very similar to the energy landscape of an inflate on a, a, a a balloon of an inflated sphere. So here what I'm reporting is the energy profile of a Neuken, of a sphere made of a Neuken material when it's subjected to pressure. And the energy profile of most of the actuators that have been designed so far is very similar to that. So the energy just keep increasing. So now what this means is that in order to, to operate this robot, we need to supply a lot of fluid, a lot of air, a lot of water, and then the inflow of this fluid anyway is restricted by viscous forces because there are many tubes, you know, we have these tiny tubes, we have valves, and so these make them basically slow. So now the question is, how can we make this actuator move fast? How can we make them, for example, jump? So jumping is an activity, you know, that when, uh, we, when I think about something fast, I think of jumping, right? It's a very fast event. And here, what we got inspired is by shell snapping. So what you see here are uh, finite element simulations on a, on a spherical cup made of an Neukem elastomeric material. And what has been studied for a long time, and here you can see paper by John Axenholm, recent paper by John Hutchinson, by Pedro Rice, is that this simple, very simple system has a very rich nonlinear behavior. So what we can see is that the pressure initially increased, but at a certain point, it reached a limit point. And then what happens is it snaps at basically constant volume. And this snapping also what we see correspond to the inversion of the, the cap. Now, what is interesting to see that this snapping also, the, as a basically this snapping comes together with a release in energy. And this was a, is a key observation for what we want to do. So now the question is, can we basically use this snapping and this energy release that comes together with the snapping in order to realize actuators that are fast and are even capable of jumping? So here is our simple machine. So basically with our design, so we take a spherical, spherical cup and then we take another spherical cup. So one is the inner cup, the other we call it a outer cup, and then we glue them together. And so to inform, basically to form a cavity. And here is our actuator. And in principle, what we can change, we can change the radius, we can change the opening angle, both of the inner and outer cap, and we can also change the material out of which both caps are doing. So this, the material, we always use rubber, but what we can change is the, the stiffness, the shear modulus. And so we started by building three different designs that we refer to as design A, B, and C. So we can see that in the first design, the inner cap is thin. Second design, the inner, we increase the thickness of the inner cup. The third design, the inner cup is identical to the second design, but the outer cup is made of a softer, softer rubber. And now here you can see basically the, the, realization, the realized sample, the sample corresponding to these three designs. So we started again using finite element simulation to, to understand the behavior of the system. So here you can see the three design. Now what we're going to do, oops, sorry. We are going to inflate. Let's try. Let's see if we can get this going. No, doesn't want to go.
Mm. Yes, here it goes. So what we see is that all three, in all three, when we inflate them, they snap. We see basically we see all three, we see a limit point, And in all three, what we see, there is some energy release. And in all three, what we see, the snapping also leads to the inversion of the inner cap, all right? So now here are the results of the finite element simulation. Again, the curve, the PV curve that we get. We use RIG so we can basically be able to retrace the full PV curve. And so now what we can also do, we can also calculate the energy release of the system. That is this area highlighted in blue in these three curves. And what we can see is that the energy of the release is larger for design C and is very small for design A. Now what we can do, we can also test our actuators, so we basically inflate them with water, an incompressible fluid, and this the experimental results are these uh, red curves. What we can see in all red curve, we can see a sudden jump. So clearly, what basically we reach the limit point, what the what the, the cap invert, and basically we jump on the immediately on the lower uh, on the lower branch a constant volume. And you see that all all jumps are a constant volume, and here you can see snapshot taken during the experiment. And what we see, basically the experimental result confirm what we have seen in our numerical simulation that this snapping result in the inversion of the inner cap for all three samples. Now, this uh, experiment I show you were done inflating with water. We also inflate them with air and we see very, very similar behavior. Now the question is, okay, what can we use this for? So, so far what we have been doing, I was, we were keeping we were fixing, let's say, the top of the actuator, but now what happened if we put this actuator on a table and we just inflate them? And now I'm in the movie I've been running and you see the sort of what we see. So what we see that when we inflate them and this in this actuator are just on a surface and they are able to move, what we see is that the inner, inner at a certain point, when we reach the limit point, the inner cap get inverts, basically, may get an inner cap inversion, but what we see for design C, this is also comes together with a jump. It's accompanied by a jump. So these results are promising. So it seems that they indicate that this energy release during snapping can be exploited to get this actuator to jump. Now the question is, how can we optimize the design in order to maximize the height of our jump? And uh, here, what we do, we, we use uh, a systematic finite element simulation to basically study the effect of geometric parameters on the, um, on the response of our actuator. So here, first, we consider the inner cap. And so what we do, we vary, we vary both the opening angle, we vary the normalized thickness, and then and then separately, we consider the outer cap, in this case, it's in, and also again, what we do, we vary the inner angle, we vary the opening angle, and we vary the normalized thickness. And now, so basically, in this way, we are able to rapidly explore the design, uh, the designs, the design space. Now, what do we, what do we want the inner cap and the outer cap to do? Well, for the inner cap, we mostly, what we do, we want, we want them to release as much energy as possible. And at the same time, we want also the pole to basically move a lot because basically we want to touch the ground. So here, what I'm plotting for the inner cap for all our simulation that we run, the, um, I'm plotting the energy release and the pole displacement as a function of the normalized radius and the opening angle. As for the outer cap, what we want is to store as much energy as, as possible because then this energy can be released during snapping and, uh, and therefore can be in can increase the amount of energy that is released. And so since we want a tweeter that release as much energy, so we want the inner cap to release as much energy as possible and the outer cap to, to uh, store as much energy as possible, then we, we see that the, 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 what we want to do, we want to focus on this region of geometric parameters, right? These are the ones that lead to the desired behavior. And now what we can do, we can basically use axisymmetric finite element analysis to simulate the response of many, the, all the actuator that we can construct by combining inner and outer cap with the, within the identified promising region. 
And so here, what I'm reporting, I'm reporting the, our numerical result for all the design we were basically we construct. And what I'm reporting is the energy release versus pole displacement for all the design we constructed. And what we can see is that both the energy release and the pole displacement, these are the two quantities we care, we think are important in order to get them to snap, is greatly increase when the jump, if you properly tune the, two, the jump. So we can go for a very small pole displacement energy release to a very large pole displacement energy release if we tune geometry properly. Now, here, now I'm uh, what I'm differentiating in this plot. So the green map I'm differentiating. So in uh, the simulation, we consider the case of both the case in which inner cap and outer cap have the same stiffness, and the case in which inner cap the soft the outer cap is softer than the inner cap. So and these are the purple marker correspond to the case in which the outer cap is softer. The green marker correspond to the case in which the outer cap has the same stiffness as the inner cap. And what we see is that the, basically both the energy release and the pole displacement are much larger for actuator in which the outer cap is maximal. So it seems that it's not only design C, but in general, if you have a softer cap, the, the response that we get is better. And then here, what I'm lighting are the inner cap for which the internal angle is 80 degrees. And for 80 degrees, we know that what we learned from previous simulation is that the response of the inner cup is optimized as sun, uh, because their energy release is maximum. And so what we see is that by choosing, by basically optimizing the inner cup, we significantly improve the response of the actuator. So the best actuator we can design are the one for which the inner cap is optimized as theta and as the specific value of internal angle. And, um, and so, and now here you can see representative PV curve for some of these actuators. An interesting point to make is that the best actuator we get, so the one up here, you can see that the jump in pressure so the distance, the jumping pressure here that we expect in experiment is going to be very, very small. However, we can see that the area enclosed by the pressure volume, by the pressure volume curve between the limit point and the corresponding point on the lower branch, there is a core point on the lower branch, is huge. So this is interesting because this means that we cannot it's difficult to use this without this insight provided by finite element simulation it would be difficult to optimize the response just doing experiment because in experiment we would be tempted to look at the at the basically the size of the jumping pressure but this does not really provide indication about the energy release and um, now, so far, we have been able to use finite element to characterize the static response of the actuator. But now, in reality, what we want to do, we want to design a actuator capable of jumping, right? We are interested in their ability to jump. So our finite element simulation are static, so we cannot extract directly information regarding to the ability of the actuator to jump. But what we did instead, so we basically established a simple uh, mass spring model that takes the finite element result as input and so here is the idea. So this is the typical output of our finite element, right? It's a PV curve. And now what we do, we design a simple uh, mass spring model where we have two masses coupled by a basically a, a spring and um, a dashpot. And now we choose the masses, the two masses equal to the mass of the inner outer cup. And we assume that they are located at the corresponding poles, as you can see here. And then what we assume is that the mechanical system in the store an amount of energy equal to the energy release in the configuration immediately before snapping and is stress-free in the configuration immediately after snapping, so in this configuration. And then what we do, initially we pre-compress the spring to store the energy delta E and then we release the system. And here is a typically response that we record. It's a very simple model. We can even get an analytical solution. And now you can see that when we solve the ODE, pretty much what we can do, we can get the, the jumping height, Y jump. We can extract the jumping height. And now here is the same marker I showed you before, but now their color, the color correspond to the jump height as predicted by our simple uh, mechanical model. 
And uh, what we can see is that, you know, the what we can see is that there is a very good correlation between energy release, pull, dis pull displacement, and jump height. So we see that the most uh, the, the design that jump the most are the are the one with basically I delta E and I uh, and I enlarge pull displacement. So now here is the best actuator we get. And so now what we can do, we can okay. So now the computer is sort of frozen. Let me try. All right, I see my computer is suffering, is refusing to move on. I think everything is frozen. Can you still hear me or is even internet frozen? We hear you. You hear me, okay. So here we have a quite a bit of a challenge, right? Okay, so I think close the, maybe I can close the program and reopen it. Okay, some improvement. So let's see if we can get this going. If not, I think I was, I don't know, we'll, if not, I went, I was lucky to be able to go far enough that I think we can close it. Uh, let me try, fingers crossed. Okay. Very good. So it's responsive again. Okay, so we identify, you know, we identify basically design that our, according to our numerical analysis are able to jump very high. And then what we can do next, let's try, let's go presentation mode, fingers crossed. Okay, it doesn't like presentation mode, but I think we can survive without. Uh, what we see is that, but if I don't go presentation mode, it's ugly. Okay, sorry. Now there is an issue with, there are plenty of issues. So uh, the problem is I have multiple screen and I'm not showing on the right screen. Okay, let's do the following. Forget about the presentation mode. Let's do this. So now what you can see here, and this is, is that we are inflating, this is the initial design and this is the optimized design and you can clearly see the difference. So the good news is that the fine, this fine numerical analysis that we were able to, to basically run and that we develop really pointed us, pointed us in the right direction and enable us to design a tweeter that now can jump quite a bit. And also another point is, you know, uh, we can jump several times. So clearly we can inflate and then we can vacuum. And so we can go back to the initial configuration and then we can jump again. And this is quite an interesting feature because in order to make this a Twitter to jump before what has been used is explosion, explosion. So, and, but you know that explosion basically damage the material. So then the jump become only a one-time activity. In this case, instead of simply exploiting instabilities and elasticity, we can jump multiple times. And so I believe, I mean, now it's, it's a one hour. We have been in for one hour. So it's time to probably to conclude. So I hope I convince you that by stable element offer a promising platform to design mechanical system with a new mode of functionality. And, um, and these include energy trapping, manipulation of elastic pulses, rapid movements, shape changes. And I'm sure there are many more out there that are waiting to be explored. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any question. Thank you, Katia. Thank you, Katia, very nice talk. Excellent, I have been very 
pleased to see all these beautiful things, uh, results in structural mechanics. So I, I will eventually uh, ask you my question, but before I would like to let other people to, to speak and to ask, uh, then the, the, the question is how to do this. I, I, I see uh, Norman popping up, uh, Tangley, uh, so, who is the first uh, asking questions? Your decision. Uh, it's my decision. So, Norman, do you want to initiate, please? Okay, lovely talk. Thanks very much, Katia. Uh, my question is, in some of these systems, I guess you've got a energy which is released from a stored state. Um, and so they're one, one way switches. They, yeah. Are there, other, are there other systems that you can recharge them and pump them up again? Yeah, uh, no, yeah did, no, this is an excellent point. So pretty much all these systems, since they are the energy profile is not symmetric, they are a one way, right? Yeah. So pretty much you can go one way, but you, uh, yeah. How do you recharge them, right? So recharge them, most of them we have to do manually, right? We have to apply a force. And this is a limitation. If you really think about application, this is a clear limitation of the system. So if you want to keep this asymmetric energy profile, what you can think is about using magnetic field, smart material to use external stimuli to basically provide the energy you need in order to go back, right? To basically ramp the, you know, the mountain that you need in order to go back to the other state. Another option is to think about a system where they have asymmetric energy profiles where basically the two wells are at the same level. Then, I mean, there are other issues because then dissipation is going to kill this, you know, then dissipation plays a, a large role because small amount of dissipation basically are going to kill the, the game, right? Mm -hmm. So I think both needs yeah, to be explored. I, guess, I, mean, I, I see that. I, I'm just wondering whether in, in materials, whether phase transformations, I guess temperature there comes in as the yeah, temperature that people, yes. and that gives some thermal energy. Yeah, um, the, now there is thermal energy, right? And temperature that provides. So in to mimic those, we could think about using temperature responsive material or uh, pH response, whatever stimulus you want to use, right? Or a, or a thermal, I mean, th vibration with a ratcheting mechanism, some way of pumping in energy. Yeah, we need pumping in, yeah. Basically, the point is one way or the other, we need to be able to pump in energy. And then, yeah, the trick is typically to, in order to enhance the fat, we want to release as much energy as possible, right? And this means we need to pump in a lot of energy. Again, then is to find a good balance between the more energy you release, the more you need to pump in. Right. Thank you. That's my Thanks, Norman. So another question from Tang Lee, please. OK, Katia, wonderful talk. I really enjoyed. Um, uh, my question is along the, uh, uh, the several examples you showed. Uh, for example, uh, uh, being the uh, energy trapping uh, structure or the elastic waveguide. So essentially, uh, two things uh, governs the design and the performance. One is the uh, topological structure design, and another one is the material. Right? So of course, you can change different materials, but it seems that even if you are using a simple material by proper uh, topological structural design, you can achieve many things. So my question is actually twofold. Uh, so are there any general guidelines when you first come up with a topological design for a certain function? For example, energy uh, absorbing uh, device, as you show over there, you do see like a somewhat uh, like hierarchical structure over there, larger structure features, smaller structure features. Now, the second fold uh, of the question is, once you have an initial design, now, if you want to maximize the performance of a certain function, what is the uh, guideline to optimize the structural design to achieve or maximize the potential? And this is, let's start from the second one. So optimization, right? I think optimization, what we have been doing, I'm not saying is the way to do it. We can use numerical simulations. So once you have a design, limited within the domain of that design if you just if the goal is to you know optimize few geometric parameters that is doable because we can use 
finite element, we can easily also, this system are quite generally simple because typically they have rigid components and very slender component beams, right? So we can also come up with reduced order models to model them. And those models can be very useful in terms of for optimizing. But the, the issue here is that you have need to first identify a configuration. That is where the tricky part come in, right? Because it's how can I identify a promising configuration? Here at the moment, I would say it's still intuition. So hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll also will be able to use more tools. There are tools coming along. Machine learning is, you know, showing promises. I mean, topology optimization has been extremely successful for linear systems. Unfortunately, I mean, you know, we are still in the developing phase for nonlinear system. All these systems I show you are really nonlinear. So unfortunately, still these systems are still challenging for topology optimization. But you know, their progresses are, you know, progresses are made as we speak. So hopefully there are gonna also be tools that enable us to identify the designs. And then I mean, when we have a design, we can directly use this tool or we can use the tool we are currently using, this forward simulation to, op to optimize them. Thank you. The, the first, the was also the first question thing that I forgot. The first about. question, it was actually, um, uh, will you try to come up with a design uh, uh, to achieve certain functions? Uh, are there any general guidelines? I think you somewhat answered this question. It's, uh, 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 so I, I think that the, the, you, you can use the analogy of, uh, if you notice uh, Google have this AlphaGo and Alpha Zero. So the uh, alpha goal is to teach the uh, 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 machine learning algorithm to learn the, in, in Asia, you have, they have this uh, uh, goal play and uh, they learn from the old plays and uh, come up with a better goal player and beat all the top players in the world. And then the alpha zero, uh, basically you just teach the basics and then the algorithm come up with some new play schemes that uh, nobody really uh, knows very well and they again they beat uh, the top players in the world i, I mean uh, as you mentioned that the machine learning could be uh, uh, leveraged to uh, come up with the initial design uh, i think probably the key is to identify the uh, governing parameters or discretize the design into certain parameters that the algorithm can uh, yeah. uh, take, I agree. take over. I think we need there. to categorize them, right? What are the elements? So there are, uh, there are specific structural elements that are coming up in all these designs, right? So there are beams elements, there are shell elements. I think we need, yeah, we need to be able to, to categorize them somehow because if you want an algorithm to basically process them in some way and combine them together. Yeah, thank you. Terrific talk. So we have another question from Li Wa Jin, please. Hey, Katia, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, so first of all, uh, in your uh, wave propagation, um, the model developed by uh, Dan, Koch, Dan Kochman. So yes. you ignore inertia, is that true? So then is that only governed by the time scale of viscoelasticity? I mean, it's a simplification, right? I mean, uh, it's, but yeah, pretty much, I mean, even in ignoring inertia, we get what we see is that we find a, a good, we see that we can capture what's going on in the, what's basically going on in the system. Okay, uh, then the second question is about your last uh, soft rubber jumper. Uh, so uh, when the rubber jumps, then you change the volume of your system, then it, uh, then you change the pressure. Do you take that into consideration or is that- So it, it, when the snapping, an interesting feature of this system is snapping is a constant volume. So, and this is why basically it can result in a fast event because basically we can, we can release energy, but we don't need while not providing more volume. So the snapping is a constant volume. So pressure change a lot. Yeah, there is a changes. There is a delta p, but volume is constant. And mm -hmm. while doing this, we release energy. We release energy, and we have a fast movement of the pole. As what we are exploiting is the constant volume part, because if it was a not constant, I mean, if the volume was changing, then it would take you know, it would take time for the volume to be supplied and then the game will be right. killed. Right. 
Okay, thanks. So the next next question comes from Tong Queen Lu. Okay. Uh, hi, hi, uh, Professor Bakhtodi. I, I have a very quick question actually uh, already mentioned by Professor Tang Li. Uh, so, uh, so as we know, the machine learning is a very hot topic. So uh, do you think there's a big opportunity uh, if you combine machine learning method and the finite element? So it, it, it particularly, uh, especially when you design such complex uh, uh, structures, the multi-stable, multi uh, yeah. And do, any, do you have any suggestion if we want to if we want to combine these two, uh, what, what can we do? So what, in what, which direction do you think is, is a good way to do this? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, know, I think, I mean, I look at machine learning as a very promising tool. So, so far what we have been using is our intuition, my intuition, the intuition of my student, the intuition of my postdocs. Mm -hmm. But you know, intuition is limited, right? And hopefully, I mean, I think it would be very, you know, it would be very helpful, very useful to have systematic tools to identify this design. I want a specific functionality, which is the, how can I arrange this different building block in order to achieve this functionality, right? And the, I mean, a problem with machine learning is that we need data. You know, I mean, required to have a significant, a large database and for this nonlinear system at the moment, I mean, there is limited data available. I mean, the good part is that we, you know, we can use numerical simulation, finite element simulation to simulate this behavior. But as Tang pointed out, we need to break down this system into small components. So when you do simulation of the entire system, those systems, you know, they have many of these beams, they are slender, you need to mesh them. The mesh has to be very fine if you want to capture the nonlinear behavior and then they take forever, right? So the simulation take very long and then how can you build a large database? So I think what we should do and what I hope we will be able to do is to basically break it down into the key components. So these shell elements, these beam elements, somehow create database for that, but then we need somehow algorithms capable of picking up this component and also you know, putting them together. Mm -hmm. And this is probably also the challenging part. Okay, thank you. David, please, David Waits. Gotcha. That was great, as always. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question that basically follows on what Tang was ask, asking. He was asking you, once you know what you what you want to do, how can you figure out what to do, how to do it? I'd like to ask, how can you figure out what you can do? How can you figure out all the things that you can do? I mean, it seems like you can do this richness. Is this still intuition or do you know, figure out Oh, these are the kinds of things I can do. <laughs> okay, do you want the honest answer? Yeah, probably yes, right? So the honest answer is- Only up to, honest answer. <laughs> only honest answer, I right? 100% <laughs> honest. So at the moment is mostly, is really curiosity driven and intuition driven. So, you know, we come in, I mean, uh, we are passionate. Everyone in my group is passionate about structure. We put them together, we see something interesting, and then we try to associate with a functionality. That I'm not saying is the efficient way to design structure to solve real world problems, to solve real problems. But hopefully also it's a way to demonstrate the potential. And now I believe we all agree that we need also tools that you know to systematically explore this potential in order to be able to also think about real functionality that are needed that you know scientists and the world is waiting for and hopefully to be able to you know match them with a structure that can help getting there but i guess that you as you learn more things that you can do you should be able to uh, develop some kind of toolbox of things that you have yeah. solved and yeah, from from that experience, maybe you can figure out what are the really the things that you can do. What are the unique things that you can do using these techniques? But that's for sure. I mean, over time, I mean, now we have a much better understanding. At the beginning, they seem sort of magic structure, right? We couldn't, get, but now we are able to break them down into small pieces. We know exactly what each piece does. And then, so I think we have a much better idea about functionality. I mean. We can release energy, we can absorb, we can design the energy profile. I mean, we can basically make a clear correlation between energy profile and what type of functionality we can extract. 
Now, I mean, if you then think about, you know, we want to push that to real application, this system are still challenging because as you've seen there, are, most of them are also very small, the inches, they basically these tiny beams that those are the ones that really drive the behavior of the system. So if you want to think about real application, you need to go down in scale and then their fabrication is still challenging and we need them to be precise in order to trick specific effects. Can I follow up cool. on the tapes uh, comment on this? Um, this is something uh, remind me of when I was in Gigan's group, I learned this phrase of a division of labor uh, in doing <laughs> research. So basically at that time it was, okay, uh, are you doing experiment or are you doing modeling or simulation? So to solve a problem, a practical problem, uh, so it really depends on uh, which way is the most efficient way to do that. And this evolves over the time. For example, in the old days, probably you all uh, mainly re rely on the uh, experimental discovery, do trial and error. Now with the increasing computation power, then for example, the Fernand method allow us to do some design, exactly like Cartier is, has been showing in this talk. Now I guess uh, nowadays with this, uh, increasing power of the machine learning algorithm, probably it's a new uh, phase of the division of labor that uh, we uh, as the scientists, that, okay, you, as Dave mentioned, okay, you come up with some idea, okay, general idea or a higher level idea, what do you want to really achieve using this mechanism? Then you can delegate this to the algorithm, let the algorithm to help you to design certain things, then you go back to experimental uh, test and use an element to optimize or combine the three of them. It's a new um, phase of uh, division of labor. Yeah, completely agree. And I, think, <laughs> and I think, you know, I fully agree. And I think, you know, now we have these new tools, this very powerful tool. And I think, you know, the interesting question, how can we integrate within, you know, what we also, what we are doing to basically, you know, to become, to improve the efficiency, right? And to basically even push the boundaries. I see another, uh, there is another hand raised uh, before from uh, Su Lin Zhang, please. Uh, hey, and then I, I... Thank you, uh, uh, Kalia, very nice talk. So I'm going to ask a more concrete question. So I see your matter structures has a lot of unit cells, building blocks. So what's the role of the size of the building block in your, in your, mo in your model, in your experiment? Uh, well, if you change the size, what if you give the gradient of size in your structure rather than a uniform size? So, Solin, are you referring to size in terms of number of unicell or size in terms of centimeter, micrometer scale? Yeah, your 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 matter your matter structure has a building block, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there is a building, so building block. I'm talking about the size of the building block. Yeah. Yeah. What if you what, what if you change the size of your uh, uh, of the build, of the building block in your matter structure? What if you 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 create a matter structure with 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 size gradient? Would the so, functionality of your matter structure remain the same or? You have yeah, so I mean more functionalities. All the structure, all the structure I show you, the building block were at the centimeter scale, roughly speaking, right? Some mm -hmm. slightly sub centimeter, anywhere around between one and ten centimeter. And this is mostly because of the, in this way it's much easier to fabricate. We can simply fabricate with a laser cutter and a commercial commercial 3D printer using tools that are widely available in these days. And also easy to test, right? It's macroscopic system, very easy to test, very easy to monitor. Now, this said, that being said, what we are exploring, so we are not taking advantage of material effects. So what we are taking advantage are geometric effects. So what we expect is to see exactly the same if you scale down, if you scale up. Now, mm -hmm. this is easy to say, not so, diff not so easy to, you know, to realize. So scale up and scale down, then pose challenges in terms of fabrication. Then, I mean, you know, you need to get clearly improve your, the way you manufacture the structure, both if you go large and also if you go, if you go small. But the effect you're gonna see, I mean, we don't, 
I mean, for a large range of scale, we expect to see exactly the same. Unless we go very, very tiny, then we're at, you know, where uh, Van der Waals interactions start to play a role, or there are additional force where that we don't account for because we are at the continuum level really come into play. Okay. So next question from Robert Painter, please. We cannot hear you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm Robert Painter from Oxford. Um, so I, I wondered whether you have thought of these, um, your jumping objects and similar ones in different fluid environments, like maybe space, so practical vacuums or high pressure or in liquids? <laughs> okay. No, at the moment, so at the moment, the only, I believe we have make it to jump in water. I mean, which basically when we increase the, the, the viscous force, right? And clearly, I mean, you know, viscous force is not helping. So the, the, the amount they can jump goes down. We have this is very new, very fresh result. We haven't we so far what we have been doing, we have been just you know inflating them in air or in water. So, but clearly then you could also think about if then you, if you have a specific functionality you have in mind, right? I want I mean this could help in space because of this and that. Then we we you know we could think and we could test about different basically environmental conditions. I'm not sure what to expect. We haven't been, basically we haven't been thinking carefully about that. Another question from uh, Hars Vardan and then from, please. We don't hear you. We cannot hear you. You're mute. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Uh, thank you, Professor Bertoldi, for a wonderful talk. And uh, incidentally, I'm, uh, I, was, I was a PhD student under Professor Rod Lakes from the University of Wisconsin. So you might be familiar with his work as well. Um, yeah. So this is uh, regarding uh, bi-stability. Uh, so uh, when, you, when you're talking about the shell, uh, you know, when you, when you have the bi-stable shell structure, there is also, you can, there is this induced negative stiffness at some point, right? When you perturb it. Uh, you know, and then you have this bistable uh, configuration. So my question is, is it physically possible to harness negative stiffness um, at the length scale of a unit cell of a mechanical metamaterial? Uh, you know, more on an instead of a structural scale, when the size is fairly small, you need to have some sort of induced force to really get an it. Yeah, now this, it's a very intriguing question, right? When you have this snapping instability, snap through you, even some time back, and you have region, limited region of negative stiffness, right? And uh, yeah, I'm familiar. I mean, I really love the work of Borod Lakes and has been trying on dynamically to have this negative stiffness inclusion and all this very fascinating work. So we haven't, I mean, in my group at least, we haven't been trying much about exploring this, this negative stiffness element and component that is associated to several of the structural elements that we are using. But for sure, it's, it would be something interesting to explore. And it's unclear to me what, I mean, I think it would be nice to explore which type of behavior are we able to get and which functionality. And this is something we haven't explored. Please, Shuang Zai Zhao. Hey, Kaidia. Hey, Shanghi. <laughs> This is, yeah, now a great place to see friends. Kind of, <laughs> so, uh, no, wonderful talk. Uh, I want to ask a general question. So one great success in the field of material science is, uh, you know, people develop this uh, wide, uh, massive uh, database, right? Metallurgy, all the way from metallurgy to, you know, this uh, protein database. And then nowadays we really see, you know, uh, this uh, machine learning algorithm leveraging those databases and it made great uh, progress. You know, this alpha, you know, fold, for example, now can predict uh, protein structure much better than, you know, uh, you know other algorithms. Uh, also designing new uh, metals. Uh, now, what's your opinion on developing a database for uh, structure or metal materials? You know, is that possible for certain, uh, you know, uh, Either property or certain, uh, you know, uh, you know, function. Uh, you know, we develop a database so that you know people with great intuition, great experience, like Kadia, can design such structures. 
But uh, for uh, many other, for example, uh, you know, uh, these are 3D printing companies or companies who wanna you know, print uh, something, uh, they can just leverage this uh, database uh, to you know, print their things. I think uh, you know, simulation experiments, especially you know, uh, this uh, simulation capability are ready uh, to, you know, uh, to, 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 to contribute to such a database. What's your opinion on that, Kelly? Yeah, I think, I say, as I pointed out, I think we should go in, that's the future, right? And we should go. In. So in my opinion now, if you know, if you look into literature, there is a zoo of these different mechanical material structural system, you know, whatever you want to refer to them. So, you know, there are tons, a lot, very large number of different architecture, right? And if you look at them, zoom out, they look all very different, right? This seems to be, but at the end of the day, the building block, are the same for all of them. So there are slender beams, there are buckling, there are shells, the buckles, there are very few building blocks. And then there are rigid bodies, or bodies at least whose deformation, as much they're there as they act as a rigid body, even if they are made of deformable material. So I think, I mean, what I hope we'll be able to do is to create a database for these basic building blocks. Because I mean, then it's, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to build them because they are small, so it's easy, it's fast to build them, and they're also well defined. And then, I mean, to be able to combine this database, you know, to basically combine these elements that are fully characterized and to arrange them into configuration leading to specific functionality. I mean, if you're able to achieve this, I think it's a more efficient way than just creating database for each po for every possible realization of mechanical mass material that have been proposed. Professor Suom, please. So uh, it's a follow-up. Everybody, uh, I have uh, watched Cartier treat up uh, this uh, fantastic geometry and also kinematics, the motion. Today, you just showed a tiny collection of your wonderful things. At some point, I also noticed uh, you harvest ideas from um, architects from people who traditionally come up with beautiful structures and beautiful motion. Can you tell, tell us about this kind of experience? Forget about a machine. <laughs> How about the people? You know, I think I was trained as a structural engineer, right? As an, I mean, so I was trained designing bridges and buildings and this is the type of training I got. So I'm always fascinated by, you know, by this type of large structures. Now, I think I was, I've been lucky while at Harvard to be able to collaborate with people at GSD, Graduate School of Design. So specifically, I've been working, for example, with Chuck Oberman. Chuck Oberman, maybe you're all, you're familiar or you've been playing with the Oberman sphere. So this toy that, you know, is the small sphere and then you, it becomes large. And uh, yeah, Chuck is an architect has been designing toys on one end, but also large infrastructure. So foldable system and expandable system is currently, is currently also teaching at uh, GSD, the School of Design. And it's always fascinating to think about how to exp And so we have been thinking, I haven't presented today, but we have worked, hopefully the soon will be out on also large scale, right? How can we use this concept for large scale structures? So clearly when we look at this method material, we are also very intrigued by miniaturization, right? Can we use to control light at the small scale? But there, is also, there are also opportunities at the large scale. So smart uh, deployable structures that you know can be easily deployed and can provide protective environment for a, whatever reason we need them. And uh, this has been, and you know, with working with Chuck, we are we are also been working with other group at GSD, uh, Martin Bechtold specifically and his group, and it's always. I find it very, for me it's very. I mean, I always find it interesting. I mean and always very exciting. And I think, I mean, the good, what at least I perceive as a good news is traditionally civil engineering has been a very traditional field, right? I mean, not much innovation in the field, right? I mean, we know how to build a house, we know how to build a bridge, let's keep building them. But now I think there is space for innovation. I think also people working in the field feel the need to try to push boundary. Can we design structures that are more efficient? Can we incorporate material that, I mean, uh, environmentally friendly? So I think there is there is there are opportunities also there, both at the materials level and at the structural level. 
I would like to uh, uh, add a question which probably has been already partially answered by Katia. But since Katia is a Harvard professor, and so she looks in the future, she is able to see things that for us are invisible yet. So I would like to ask her what, in her view, it's a new field for application of structural engineering, because she has shown us many beautiful things, many new objects. So my question is, what do you think could be uh, an emerging field, a new field of application for structural engineering? I think, I mean, there are, yeah, I, I mean, I think there are, a, I hope, I hope we'll be able to, you know, at the end of the day, it's our, you know, it's our role. We need to show example and we need to push the system, right, and convince people that those systems are promising candidate to solve application. But robotics, clearly, I mean, you know, the robots are structures. There are soft robots, there are rigid robots, but they are all structures at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, what you want, you want to make them efficient, right? You want little energy to be to give you big, mo you know, large movements. And clearly there is an electronic problem, there is a computer science problem, but there is also a structural problem. Sure. And uh, then again, I mean, there are also, I hope there are gonna be also opportunities and uh, at the architectural level. Clearly, I mean, I don't, you know, if you think about traditional buildings that we have been running, building for many years, you know, there is clearly standards there, there are standards there, but, you know, there are also large scale construction, there is the need for this foldable system, deployable structures. And hopefully also there, there is room for this innovation. And then hopefully, I mean, you know, going a bit more also the small scale, controlling waves, controlling, can we able to control vibrations, right? This is a problem in many devices, you know, right. many machines that surround us. Now, can we use structural principle to also help with that. Right now, typically, I mean, material principle are used, right? Piece of rubber damp as a damper. So can we maybe get more efficient using structural principle? And another uh, another field that I think is clearly the medical field. Right? Now, I mean, uh, sur uh, surgical robots. Uh, again, those tiny objects that we need to design to go into the body, right? And, and hopefully what you want to do, they want it to deploy when in the body. It's not a purely structural problem, but clearly structure also there plays a role. I mean, I think the advantage of that maybe the advantage here is structural everywhere at any scale, a large scale, a small scale, and any field, any, any object you build at the end of the day, there is a structure. And, and clearly now is the point is, can we somehow, clearly we know to build the structure, people are building the structure, they have been building them for years, or some, but can we provide better design? Can we try to basically optimize them? And maybe to design in such a way that they provide multiple functions. Yeah, we are partisans of structures. So <laughs> I, I don't see other hands raised. And so I, please- I have me. a question, David. Excuse me? Ah, sorry, Jimmy, I didn't Jimmy, see- Jimmy Shah here. Okay. I wasn't able to, to see you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Katia, wonderful talk, beautiful talk. Uh, your components, you, you have several different structures that you presented. And uh, uh, many of them are put together using components, whether it's foldable structure, whether it's you know, uh, soft robotics and so on. These components are generally speaking of the same size or similar size. If you look at the, for example, uh, structures in nature, very often they are hierarchical structures, very different sizes of different scales uh, as you go you know, into, it's almost uh, actually uh, to, to a certain degree, Zhigong's question is also relevant. Even if you look at large structures, buildings, they're hierarchical. They're, they're big beams and they're furnitures. Uh, so any thoughts about how to expand what you've been doing to uh, maybe explore the possibilities of uh, more complex hierarchical structures? This is an excellent suggestion and a very good point, right? If you look 
around sur structures surrounding us, they always have multiple lens scale, pretty much, right? If you look even at human body, we, I mean, everything has, everything does, and even typically everything that we did. So as all the structure we, more, pretty much almost all the structure we have been looking at, we only have, yes, one lens scale, right? And why is that? Well, I think up to this point, we are really, most of have been exploring, right? We have been trying to explore these behaviors. And, but now I think we also, I agree with you that now we also have a decent database of data points, right? We collected a certain, we have explored a number of structures, significant number of structures. So probably it's also time to then put them together a different landscape. For us, I mean, we like, to combine experiment with theory. Now, when you think about the hierarchical system, then also the fabrication is a bit more challenging. It requires fabrication of different landscapes. But hopefully, you know, I mean, this is something that, you know, we will be able to work on in the future. But I agree that also the integration of multiple landscapes is something we should see. I mean, the field, not only us, but we should think about how to figure it out, how to incorporate that, because that could provide significant advantages. I mean, we could take advantage of this multiple landscapes in the same system. So perhaps machine learning uh, that Tang mentioned would also be relevant if you want to truly explore the opportunities. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Thank we you. We have another question from, sorry, you didn't finish? No, we have another question from Jason Stack. Hi, Katya. Hey, Jason. Um, uh, I'm a PhD student in Jagong's group, and uh, I had a question about the 2D energy storage structures. So um, when it was in just 1D, you could, uh, and it was uh, going to release energy when it changes from one state to another, you could just initiate it and then it would propagate through the entire material. But in 2D, it almost looked like a nucleation problem. Like you needed to probe it and Locally, some of these unit cells would change into the uh, different phase, but you had to probe it enough for it to propagate yeah. through this, this material. Um, I, this seems like uh, it would be an important design parameter if you're actually going to try to design these deployable structures yeah. in higher dimensions. No, I fully agree. So I fully agree. So basically what you see is we need to store enough energy, right? And then so we have, we can basically release enough energy to basically go and take, right? so then the old cell basically can collapse and start this chain effect. You've also probably noticed that the boundary effect plays a big role. Mm -hmm. So you notice that this wave start as soon as the collapse basically cell reach the boundaries. And then as, 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 far, as soon as they reach the boundary, really the waves take over. So boundary plays, boundary plays a role. So the, you know, the, the geometry of your system, the macroscopic geometry. And then I fully agree that also basically, you know, the local energy barrier, right? I mean, the local, the local energy landscape for each individual unit cell plays a role. It's something that, and this pretty, we haven't explored much. So we are very focused on these two design I show. We haven't explored the landscape. Again, there is a rich landscape because you know, we chose one geometry, one specific geometry. So in the paper by Damiano Pazzini and Amat Ramsajani, I think they identify five or six geometry that are bistable. Again, those, you know, I was talking about machine learning, those geometry were identified guided by intuition. So I'm not saying there are only existing five. And this probably, you know, I'm pretty sure that these are a small subset of the possible geometry, but those are the ones that we currently, we know. And again, clearly this call for better tools to basically be able to, you know, identify a larger, you know, a larger set of such structures. Thank you. Um, a question from Jost Vlasak, please. Hi, Katia, wonderful talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, so most of your work really focuses on um, geometric nonlinearities, and I was just wondering how much scope is there for including material nonlinearities and instabilities. Yeah. I mean, uh, have you thought about that? Yeah, yeah, and this is an excellent question. And this also goes along what with Jimmy was saying, right? So basically, this 
hierarchical, lens, uh, hierarchical uh, landscape because you could think about, you know, we have a structural landscape and then we have a material lands, uh, landscape. And now if right now the material, what we use is either a rigid acrylic or a piece of rubber. So there is not much of a structure there is the simplest you can get. But clearly now you can think, um, we, have, we, we are currently working with both Jennifer Lewis and Joanna Eisenberg and a material model we are using, as a material system we are using are liquid crystal elastomers. Liquid crystal elastomer at least, you know, pro enable us to, so to, to have better, I mean, better control of the material property and tune them as a function of temperature, right? Basically, we can control the anisotropy and we can also control when basically we make it, we go from soft, you know, when we deform it, when we go through the nematic to isotropic transition. So this is a, an example we are currently working, but I agree that basically also embedding material features, so basically also incorporating smarter material, not smarter, but material with a more richer, with a richer behavior, but for, further enhance the functionality because that you could think about this could maybe you could depending on the different environmental condition you could tune the response you could go from specific functionality to another or you could even have a cascade maybe induce material instabilities that could you know so and three, maybe hopefully take advantage of those li hua li hua Actually, I have more questions. Yeah, I really appreciate like uh, how you integrate theory and uh, experiments together. So, more questions. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we know if you have stable spring or like stable structure, then more or less one unit cell can represent the behavior of the whole geometry. But now, if you have bistable unit cells, then one unit cell is probably not enough. Then does that mean you need the whole structure or maybe certain number of unit cells? Uh, then, second question. Uh, you show very nicely, uh, you can use discrete model so that you can simplify a geometry by simple spring dashboard components. Yeah, we have also learned from you. Yeah, in a few of our recent EML paper, we also simplify our structure by units cells, then try to understand them. Um, but sometimes, yeah, we also, we had a lot of try and error then eventually figure out the right uh, discrete model. So I also want to see your comments, how you simplify a structure, maybe get the right unit, uh, discrete components. You know, I, I, yeah, so as you probably noticed and yeah, so yeah, we moving more and more toward discrete models because now this system we are exploiting dynamics. So we need a larger new number of unit cells. So finite element is good as far as you have, you can do characterize the behavior of the structure looking at a unit cell, right? So relatively small models. As, as soon as then, you know, you go to large, you need more units to cut the dynamic when you have this bistable system, then there are limitations regarding the finite element. Discrete model, I mean, clearly, once you have them, they're good, right? It's a system of ODE, you integrate numerically, use Runge Kuta, and it's, they are fast. Now, I agree completely, I see, I share your frustration is setting them up, right? I mean, the rough idea is easy, right? Rigid bodies, some springs, some, yeah, some beam or some spring, but how to calibrate those springs, the detail of those beams in order to basically make sure that you really capture the behavior of your structure, not only qualitatively, but also quantitative, that is the challenge. And uh, what we do is we typically use finite elements. So if we use finite element basically to, yeah, to, to translate the, whatever the structural feature into beam, you know, to, characterize basically to identify the stiffness of this element and how to basically map the, the um, structural property into stiffness of a spring, rotational spring, a linear springs. Or in, in, I saw in your, some of your model, you also use a beam, right? For example, for the Kirigami for basically capturing. Also there, what, I mean, reality in your structure, the width of the beam is changing, right? And where does the beam start and where does it end? And uh, yeah, at this point has been, as I think we don't have a, a universal strategy and I think we share kind of your frustration. So it's every time you need to go there and carefully, you know, carefully look at the structure and make some assumption that, you know, and this assumption vary from structure to structure. Also because, from, I mean, it's, each structure at the end of the day is different and each structure, this element interact in a different way. So, Hopefully, I mean, yeah, I think we need to, 
hopefully in the future we'll be able to we'll get better at breaking down this structure into the individual, basically in the individual elements, right? Also, the first question. Oh, bistable spring. So go, I forgot the first question, Liha. A bistable spring. But the bistable springs. Yes, so, there are many unit cells, right? To see. But all the springs we have are uh, ah the bistable springs in the. Um, are you referring to the two D model? Uh yes, or or in general, right? Because if you have some spring which are unstable, then you connect together. Then if they, if you study their behavior in a series, then you cannot choose a single. Uh, spring to represent the behavior. Of yeah, typically what we typically each of these elements, since basically all this uh, structural element introduced the system, they not only contract, but typically they also bend, right? So yeah. typically, I mean, at the end of the day, we, we end up with a combination of linear and uh, the longitudinal and rotational spring at every, basically to replace any structural element. And as far as we can, we try to keep those springs linear. So most of the study, most of our, our numerical study, the springs are linear. And instead what we do, we basically introduce multiple springs. So we're typically a rotational and a longitudinal spring, maybe also shearing. So typically three spring, one to capture the longitudinal behavior, one to capture the shearing behavior and one to capture the rotation. Three linear springs seems to be I mean, seems to do a good job, and also, and then depending on the depending on the way you arrange them, you can also get by stability. So arranging them in proper ways. Zigang, please. Yeah, Katya, Our, this is about a question about uh, education. More or less, we begin to touch on this issue of education. So, so again, you have. Uh, uh, unusual geometric imagination of uh, energy landscape of a many, many uh, wells. So multi uh, uh, stable, but that's not just energy itself. It's not just about analysis, also about a functionality, also about a kinematics. Uh, how do you go from one place to another? And sometimes it's also about a material. So what materials you can use, let's say you use the elastomer sometimes, you also put your structure, some rope in it, right? So here's a, so, so far, as far as I know, there's no course talking about all this uh, creativity. How, how do we do this? I'm just uh, reminded with, uh, when I was a professor at uh, Princeton, there is a, uh, this is a very famous professor, um, Burlington or something. He teaches uh, civil engineering, structural engineering. What he does, instead of do detailed analysis of a structure, he just show you the beautiful structures and show you how each one works, who designed it, what are the overriding concept. The question to you is, uh, do you think there's a room for teaching a, beautiful, a course on beautiful structures created in recent years, nonlinear structures? Do you see, rather than analysis, everybody can formulate analysis course. There are textbooks. I don't think it's very valuable anymore. What's valuable is how to let students to know Katia Batoli's intuition. That's valuable. But, yeah, so I think, I mean, on one end you need the, I mean, you need also the tools, right? I think it's a, it's a complete, what the way I see is probably a two level thing because on one end, you need to have the tool in order to be able to investigate the structure, right? On the other end, you also need to have the intuition to put them together. Right. So I think, you know, and both components plays an important role because if you only have the intuition, but then you don't know the principle, you can come up with idea, but then you cannot really, re you know, there are some design at the detail, at the at the structural level that you need to you know carry out in order to make the structure to work uh -huh. but on the other hand i agree that only knowing the principle is not enough because then you need to figure out that those elements are typically you know they need they are part of a large they can be part of larger structure that can have complicated functionality and complicated behavior mm -hmm. and i fully agree that last year when i was teaching 120 and now yost has been teaching this semester sometime i'm pretty sure the student miss this you know when you teach them beam bending and 
strength of message, strength of material, it's very difficult for the student to grasp this. They are so concentrated on the detail that then it's difficult to, you know, for them to zoom out to understand that this simple element can be part of a larger system and that larger system can be used in a variety of applications. So at the GSD, the graduate school, they have this more, they have a class that Joanna Eisenberg has been teaching with Martin Bechtel, this micro, nano, macro, I think is the title. So where they expose this, and the idea is to, the idea is interesting because it's to basically bring together engineering students and design students and trying to mostly focus on the functionality, on the, not on the detail, but mostly on the, you know, the principles. And the way this class is run is uh, there are basically guest lecturers. I, you know, I typically go there every year to give a, a class, I mean, to give a lecture. And then there are other, uh, Jennifer Lewis, typically, who's also uh, Rob Wood, that who's going to give a, um, uh, the webinar in a couple of weeks. It's also typically there, too. So I think, I mean, there is this idea. I think this idea of putting together intuition aesthetic and principle is emerging. And at least we, we, are, we have been, I mean, there have been some experiments, mm -hmm. but it's at the very early, very early, I would say. Typically, you know, there are, on one hand, there were structural engineers and the other, you know, this, that knew the principle and the other hand, there were designer who knew how to make them, you know, this organic and beautiful structure, but not how to basically connect them. And now there are efforts, I mean, there are, they're coming up effort in trying to bring those together. Thank you. I think Z Chen, Z, I saw you yeah, raising your hands for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the beautiful talk as always. Um, so I have some uh, questions regarding the, uh, the your study on jumper. Um, so I saw that in one of the videos that uh, the step through uh, behavior is not uh, axisymmetric. Yes. So is, is that the uh, uh, because of defects or is that uh, by purpose? So there are two things. Uh, if it's uh, defects clearly play a big role, but also when you increase, and also the thickness play a big role. And the larger the thickness, I mean, as, uh, the large thickness is very difficult to be axisymmetric. If mm -hmm. you do a thin shell in reality, I mean, you could be axisymmetric, but then, you know, when you fabricate, is pretty much never axisymmetric. Also, one point, anyway, one important point, all this finite element analysis we have done, we assume to be axisymmetric. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all the analysis we have done, we assume to be axisymmetric. Why? Because computational cost. I mean, much mm -hmm. cheaper to run an axisymmetric analysis. And what we see is that, you know, we are very, very close to what we observe in experiments where we are non-axisymmetric. So this clearly has an effect, but not a major effect, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you think it may be because uh, when, when you manufacture it, it's not uh, axisymmetric, like the thickness distribution? I mean, you know, with, with yeah, we haven't carefully, clearly you could, we, we haven't carefully investigated the, every, very much every single shell we fabricate goes non-axisymmetric. And, mm -hmm. uh, Clearly, I mean, the mold, we at least, what we design is perfectly, is perfect, then, you know, it gets reprinted and then it gets casted. And along the way, we are accumulating imperfection here and there, right? And clearly what the final result, I'm, sh I'm pretty sure, is, I mean, it's not perfect, so it's not axisymmetric. Mm -hmm. And it seems that even some very small imperfection basically are driving the system out of the ideal deformation scenarios. Yeah. So it's very sensitive to small imperfections. So the bottom part is like a, it's like a pot, toy popper, right? So yeah, the this, bottom part um, is a toy popper pretty much. But is it intrinsically bistable or is it monostable? Because the toy popper most of the time is monostable. So there are both. And in fact, we did, I didn't pay, we didn't pay much attention here, but basically, you know, when we, did, we have this contour plot, this plot where there are many, you know, 5,000 design and each of them is a marker. Some of them are bistable, some mm -hmm. of them are monostable. Okay. And uh, you know, does in our in this case doesn't matter much. What we care is about release of energy. So mm -hmm. whether it's monostable or bistable doesn't matter much. So we haven't been careful, but basically in the plot, when we look at all the simulations, some of them are bistable, some of them are monostable. Okay. 
Um, and one last question is, as, as a, a soft robot, um, I mean, right now it can it can just jump, right? Have you thought about how to, you know, um, add other features or, you know, local yeah, no, That's a very good point. Right now it can just jump. This is what it can do. It can jump, it can jump several times, but that's it. it, cannot do anything yeah. else. So now I think the question is, can we integrate that into existing soft robots or mm -hmm. into, you know, this basically the way I see it, this should be a component, right? Sort of a component of a, a machine with that can do more sophisticated function than just jumping when I pressurize it. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Are there other questions? Yeah, I see Janfei. Jan Hi, Karia. Uh, very uh, okay. Hey, uh, Karia. Very nice uh, talk. So, uh, in in the section of this uh, spring and the bar model, that reminds me uh, very much like uh, the so-called uh, Franco Kantorova model in surface uh, science. The surface science when they have this uh, one uh, monolayer, and then, then between atoms they put the springs, and then the atoms sit on the potential, a sinusoidal potential uh, well on the substrate. So our friend uh, uh, Sulin, actually, uh, Sulin here. So Sulin also did some nice work on this so-called ripple location using similar ideas of this uh, uh, franco kandarova model. So uh, when people use the franco kandarova model, this is spring and joint or spring and the bar model, they find out that there are many, many in physics, as they call solitons, but that's in our language, it's also just dislocations. So in your, this, um, in you, when you have this long chain of a spring and a bar, you seem to have some kind of a uniform uh, uh, deformation. Do you sometimes to see very localized deformation like the dislocation in from Kandorova model or like the ripple location in Sulin's work? Yeah, so, we in all we have a, in recent year we have established a quite a number of these uh, chain model and now in this talk I presented one but we also have model for systems that are basically monostable the one I presented for bistable system in all the system at least we have been studied what we see is we don't see localization right what we see is more this homogeneous behavior right where they, we have we have uh, solitons in a, in other system monostable what we see we see soliton propagating. And typically, there is no localization in what we have seen. Now, more, uh, more recently, what we have started, then you can start thinking about playing with geometric parameters, right? I mean, you can change the stiffness of the hinges, and you can, you know, you can change the, the inertia ratio, whatever you want to change. And then there seems to be signal from time to time of this type. This time, from time to time, it seems there are signal of localization, but we haven't studied them carefully. But I, what I can say is we see this sort, we see signal that indicate that what you are, you know, what you're referring to is probably possible. We can have these localized events, but uh, so far we haven't been, we haven't been able to identify region in the parameter space consistently when we can, and we haven't been able to observe it experimentally. Also. Maybe maybe the number of units in your system is just too low. Yeah, because I think yeah, the, the point is then become you know system size. And uh, at a certain point, we also become, we, we were very excited numerically, but the reality is that also when, when we do the experiment, friction damping plays a big role and then everything got, we were unable to observe it basically in experimental. But hopefully, I mean, we can, it would be nice to identify design in which this phenomena can emerge also within the limited experimental condition that we can currently, you know, realize. Thank you. Deepak. Hi, uh, hi, Prof Katia. Uh, I am a final year PhD student from National University of Singapore. So my PhD focus has been on like designing auxetics using shape and topology optimization as well as isogeometric analysis. So I followed some of your papers and but it's really fascinating to see your work while you present. So uh, actually some of the questions have already been addressed. So I would like to ask another broad question. So from the aspect of negative poison ratio, there have been so many uh, so much literature about like enhanced mechanical properties. So like about uh, improved specific energy absorption, better tuning of the elastic waves. 
so like what is your uh, take on like from the perspective of negative poison ratio and like what are the like up to date applications or something like that because i am exploring towards that particular area yeah. Yeah, no, yes. negative poisson ratio material, very interesting class of material, right? I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, you pull and then you expand, you... And somehow, maybe, I mean, some of these bistable structure, they sort of do the same, right? I mean, you know, yeah. they basically they get compact, right? And now, yeah, I agree. Then the question, I fully agree with you now, I mean, the interesting part with negative poisson ratio that you can also design them to be negative post ratio in the linear regime. So you can use topology optimization, those tools that are very efficient, right? In design, in identifying yes. designs. Now then the question becomes, what can we use them for? And uh, so, I mean, uh, in um, UK, so I since, I mean, there were been some startups starting here and there, mostly looking at protective equipment, right? Because they in enhance uh, energy absorption. I haven't been closely followed, so I'm not sure how successful those have been. I believe also probably, and I hope also the maybe biomedical field might be a good, okay. you know, provide good opportunities okay. because, you know, there are, when you think about uh, surgery or patches that you need for, you know, for uh, to, uh, to cover bound, hopefully, I mean, this property, this ability to contract in all direction might be, I mean, uh, might provide interesting opportunities. Okay. But yeah, okay. I agree that is, uh, there is, uh, as far as I know, probably, you know, uh, a kill, the killer application would we'll say uh, hasn't been identified, right? At least this is what I see. I don't know if you share the same feelings or if you think there are killer mm -hmm. applications. Uh, actually, like uh, I used like, topology optimization or shape optimization in uh, non-linear regime to design these materials. And I have focused on some applications, like as you said, biological applications, yeah. where I designed the patch to match the negative poison ratio of cat skin, for example, which was already published. And I am working on uh, matching stress strain curves, etc. And I like some other applications also I have been working on that. But yeah, I agree with your opinion that I was looking for something more better application, something I like that. I think also, I mean, um, Nike, Under Armour, they put in, a, I would say, significant effort a couple of past year. In, uh, you know, they introduced both Nike and Under Armour the running shoes, mm -hmm. where they incorporate yeah. negative Poisson ratio elements, either on the upper or either on the sole or on the upper part of the shoes. And uh, at least I've been chatting, not been getting involved, but I've been discussing a bit with Under Armour uh, researchers. And they were, uh, I mean, they're still investigated. They still see potential, mostly also for uh, smart textiles, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, designing textiles that better fits the, you know, our body. So this yeah. is what they're looking for. They're at least the direction that they are also exploring. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Does someone see any other hand? No. Uh, Zigang, you have found a way to exploit the speakers for hours and hours. <laughs> it's a great idea, actually. Compliments. Uh, no, I so, think it's a great idea, this webinar. It's really a great idea. I mean, it's a remarkable. Yeah. So uh, you know, when I was young, we, uh, I went to uh, many Gordon conferences. I also organized one. The thing I learned most from these conferences are after lecture discussions. People, great people are put on spot to answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Katya. Thank well, you. thank you everyone. I mean, yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Jigan, thank you for much, uh, putting this together and well, David for uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Is we are, have to thank you for, for all this uh, effort you have done for two hours and a half. Thank you. Uh, and please let me thank anybody who is still attending this seminar. Uh, thank, thank to everybody. And thanks to the gang who to have invented this uh, sort of new, new rule, new, new, I don't know how to call it, no, new type of conference. Yeah, David, this is our uh, weekly highlight.
Many count colors. <laughs> yeah, it's, and we need some light. Things. This is our weekly highlight. Yeah, and we this need a light in these days. Exactly. Uh, Jimmy and other organizers organizing this type. Of yeah. So next week, uh, we will have uh, same time, same um, Zoom link. We will have uh, a talk on um, magnetic robots by Metten City. Nice. Yeah. Uh, from a Max okay. Planck Institute. Yeah. All right. See and, you next uh, week. Hmm. John Rogers would be the uh, host. Discussion leader. Yep. Discussion leader. Right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Great. See you next Thank week. You much. Bye. Bye. See you all next week. See you next week. Thanks, Steve.